Welcome to the Mini PCR Sleep Lab webinar. My name is Sebastian Krebs. I'm a molecular neurobiologist, and today we're going to be talking about the genetic control of sleep and circadian clocks. I am with Mini PCR Bio. We're a small biotech company out of Massachusetts, and our mission is to bring science to more people in more places. For that, we bring a small, portable, and efficient molecular biology equipment that we complement with educational kits and curriculum, our learning labs. If you don't know us yet, check us out at minipcr.com. My colleagues from MiniPCR Bio, Bruce and Zeke, are also on the chat today to answer your questions as we go along. Today, we'll focus on one of our learning labs, the MiniPCR Sleep Lab. This lab will take us right into the genetics of sleep. Of course, that's a fascinating topic for all of us, but the study of sleep is also the territory of complex biology. Sleep is influenced by many environmental factors, from coffee to screen time to jet lag when we travel across time zones, our behavior, and our culture. From a genetic standpoint, sleep is also complex. There is no single gene for sleep so what I love about being here with you today is that we'll talk about a fascinating problem in biology that will force us to think more deeply about genetics. The one gene, one trait paradigm doesn't apply here, and we must look beyond the tools of simple Mendelian genetics. Mendel, of course, dealt with simple traits in pea plants. He made powerful observations and deduced laws of inheritance that hold true for many traits and are great for explaining the color and texture of a pea pod. But today we'll go beyond that way of thinking as we dive into a much more complex trait in human behavior. So the mini PCR sleep lab brings the study of complex traits into your classroom. And it does that based on a trait sleep that everybody loves. It also allows you to learn something new about yourself as we'll test our own circadian genes. And in doing all of this, we'll engage with an open question in biology. I love this lab because it's an authentic investigation that offers no cookie cutter answers. Every time is a new authentic experiment. So let's dive right in. We all have an internal timekeeping system, the circadian clock that controls rhythms and physiology and behavior with a period that is close to 24 hours. That's why we call it circadian from the Latin circa diem, close to one day. Light is, of course, a very direct influence on our internal clock, synchronizing it to the external day-night cycles. And clocks are a very widely conserved feature of mammals, but also present in other animals. And they're even present in a surprisingly wide range of organisms, from plants to fungi and even bacteria. Yes, single cell cyanobacteria, and this was a question that came in before the webinar, single cell cyanobacteria do have clocks, and scientists have shown that if you genetically eliminate the clock from something as simple as a cyanobacterium, it can be easily outcompeted by its wild type counterparts that do have functional clocks, proving that having a circadian clock confers an adaptive advantage. And that is perhaps why clocks have arisen so many times independently throughout the history of evolution. But let's go back to us mammals. The circadian clock controls a wide range of processes within us. Some that may be apparent to you, such as when we wake up or are tired and go to rest, uh, when we're at our finest physically, cognitively, or when our attention wanes. Uh, but there are many other processes that may be less apparent to you, such as when your blood pressure rises and falls throughout the day, uh, your, core body, your core body temperature is also under circadian control, the release of hormones from your glands is under circadian regulation, and something even as fundamental as when genes are turned on and off inside each one of our cells is under circadian regulation. So personally, for a long time, I've found this topic, this phenomenon fascinating, that so many processes in living organisms, including us, are closely tied to the duration of a day, that the rotation of the Earth around its axis somehow found its way through the chisel of evolution 
to these circadian programs of behavior and physiology being hard-coded into our DNA. And I found this idea so compelling that I decided to focus a good chunk of my life on this topic. And I spent five years looking at the question of how the molecular control of circadian clocks works through my doctoral work at Harvard Medical School, working in the lab of Chuck White. And here you see a picture of a younger me holding up my favorite model organism, the golden Syrian hamster. And why use hamsters as a model organism for circadian behaviors? I think the picture holds the clue, and you may have already guessed it. Hamsters not only love to run on the wheel, but they do that on a strictly circadian pattern. Um, if you've had a pet hamster, you know this. Hamsters are nocturnal, which means they're the opposite of us. They like to get active as we go to bed. And what you see on this graph, called an actogram, is a trace of a hamster's activity. As you can see during the day, the animal is resting. And as the sun sets, the hamster jumps on the wheel and runs, 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 making this dark block on the actogram. Uh, runs all through the night. It can run the equivalent up to a marathon. They're very long distance runners uh, in one night. And towards the end of the night, the circadian clock tells it it's time to rest and it goes back uh, to, to rest. Now, this animal is being kept under constant darkness. So there are no external time, um, time cues. And if you look at the next day, the hamster will repeat the same pattern with pretty, pretty much 24 hour clock-like precision. The internal clock will tell it to jump on the wheel at the same time 24 hours later and again it will run through the night and rest as the sun rises or its internal sun rises. This pattern will repeat itself uh, pretty much indefinitely if we follow this hamster's actogram for several more days. But if you're a circadian researcher like I was at one point and look at uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of these actograms for many different hamsters you might find the occasional hamster that looks oddly different. And here it goes. Here's a hamster that follows a circadian pattern of behavior, rests during the day, and jumps on the wheel at night. But look at what happens on the second day. After a period of rest, the hamster jumps on the wheel way too early, several hours early, and runs and then rests again. And if we follow this hamster over several days, we would see that this pattern of early activity repeats itself on every day of the hamster's life, tracing this leftward slope on the actor, making like a diagonal instead of a steady, steady straight line down. So this hamster seems to live on a fast clock. And what's interesting is if you find two of these hamsters and they happen to be of opposite sex and you can mate them to each other, their offspring will also be more hamsters running on fast clocks. So something about our uh, internal genetic clock that is normally so precisely under 24 hour control can actually be tweaked by naturally occurring generic, genetic variants or mutations. This is a pretty profound finding. And we're lucky to be alive at a time when we know a lot about how genes control circadian rhythms down to the level of the individual genes, molecules, and mechanisms involved. And we know this in part through beautiful work pioneered in the fruit fly Drosophila, which has a very similar clock at a molecular level to us mammals. Some of the pioneers of this work on clocks, um, Mike Rosbash and Jeff Hall at Brandeis University, and Mike Young at Rockefeller University got awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2017 for this work. So it's really cool Nobel winning science that we're talking about today and that you get to do in your classroom with the sleep lab. And what these and other scientists uh, help figure out is that the clock mechanism ticks inside individual clock cells of the brain in the form of a genetic feedback loop. So the circadian feedback loop is caused by changes in gene expression. That's a word we use to signify when genes are turned on and off. And in the circadian feedback loop, clock genes are turned on and off at different times of day. So it works more or less 
like this. During the day, clock genes, and we'll take the period gene as an example, are actively transcribed. That means they're on and, oops, and mRNA is being transcribed from the period gene. Uh, as the day progresses, that mRNA travels outside of the cell nucleus into the cytoplasm, where, of course, it'll meet ribosomes, and the ribosomes will translate the mRNA and make period protein, um, this per protein here. As day turns to night and period protein accumulates in the cytoplasm, it eventually enters back into the nucleus, where it will form complexes with other clock proteins, um, we use the example of cryptochrome on this slide, and these complexes will go on to shut off transcription from the period gene, thus causing period mRNA to fall again in the night. So during the day, mRNA is actively transcribed because the gene is on, and then as a lot of the gene gets produced and translated into protein, it goes on in the night to shut off its own transcription thus causing uh, mRNA levels to fall. And this creates a beautiful wave-like uh, pattern in gene expression or mRNA, mRNA expression from these clock genes, which I find entirely fascinating that a gene acting as a repressor of its own transcription can create a rhythmic wave of gene expression that in turn translates into a wave of circadian changes across your whole body from sleep to metabolism. So when I first learned that, the idea just grabbed me in the brain so powerfully that I really, really wanted to become a circadian biologist and learn more and contribute to knowing more about how these clock genes can control behavior. So now that we know the role that period gene uh, plays at the center of the clock, we're ready to talk about today's lab that will take us right into our own per genes. So let's talk about the human per genes. Humans have not just one, but three per genes that arose through gene duplication throughout evolution. And today we'll focus on one of them, per three or period three. We know that it is a clock gene expressed rhythmically in uh, our clock cells of the brain, but we don't really know a whole lot about its specific function. There's little data on the concrete function of per three in mice or humans. But one intriguing fact about PER3 is that it comes in many different variants or alleles across human populations. And some of that variability is in exon 18 within the protein coding sequence uh, of PER3. And that form of genetic variation that we see in PER3 is also present in other DNA sequences. It's called a VNTR uh, for variable number tandem repeat. That sounds like a mouthful, um, but it simply means that a DNA sequence repeats itself several times in a row, a variable number of times. And in the case of PERT3, uh, the repetitive sequence is 54 nucleotides in length, and it either repeats itself four times for the short allele of PERT3, or five times, one, once more in the case of the five repeat allele that is 54 nucleotides longer. And because this repeat happens to be in the coding sequence, those 54 extra nucleotides result in 18 extra amino acids in the PER3 protein for the long variant. So that's really intriguing. And uh, scientists wondered if this difference of 18 amino acids uh, means anything functionally, is functionally different for the long form of uh, PER3. So today we're going to try and find that out. We're going to do that the, by performing a complete molecular biology workflow that will allow us to analyze our own PER3 genes and discover which of the two variants, the long or the short one, we carry. And for that we'll go in three steps, which you'll see are very easy to do in a home setting like I am today or in a classroom setting. But because many classrooms are shut down, uh, for obvious reasons, I'll do it right here with you. Uh, first, we'll extract DNA. Then we'll use PCR to amplify our PER3 genes in that repetitive region. And finally, we'll use gel electrophoresis and DNA visualization to see which alleles or variants we carry. 
All of that can take about two hours beginning to end if done sequentially, but it's also very easy to break that down into two class periods. Today I'll do it in hybrid cooking show style as you all follow along. So of course I'm at home and I needed to find experimental subjects for this. I didn't have any students, so I took my family, the Craves family, as the experimental uh, subjects. It's a great experiment to do with a large number of students, but I'm stuck at home during the pandemic and I decided to study our own PER3 genes and sleep behaviors. Maybe we'll learn something that we didn't know about ourselves. So going in, I asked everyone in my household what was their sleep preference. Are they um, people who like to be active in the morning, morning larks, or are they folks who like to sleep late? Uh, and would define themselves as night owls. And here is what I found, what I heard. Mom said she's 100% a morning type, and I couldn't agree more before I even opened my eyes in the morning. Mom is up and about doing stuff. Uh, myself, Sebastian, I'm quite the opposite. I'm, I'm definitely a night owl, and I enjoy uh, staying up late and waking up late as well. Layla, our oldest daughter, she's 10. And she's definitely more like me. She loves to read into the late hours of the night and is not in the best of moods when she wakes up to go to school in the morning. And Eva is a little bit harder to read. I would say that she's pretty active in the morning and has a lot of positive energy. However, her own idea of herself is that she thinks of herself more as more of an evening type. So we'll see today by using the tools of sleep research and genetic analysis if these predictions hold true. So then I went on to ask my uh, family for DNA donation so that I could genotype them at the PER3 locus. Um, the DNA extraction in this lab is super easy and I could even do it easily with my eight-year-old Eva. Um, to do that, I'll show you. You simply take a toothpick blunt ended preferably, uh, rub a few cells by scraping gently in the inner lining of your cheek and dip it into a DNA extraction solution that comes with the kit, the extract buffer. So you just dip, 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 remove the toothpick, deposit those cells and cap that tube. Uh, so that's all it takes to just collect a few cells and the extraction buffer that comes with a kit um, has an alkaline pH that together with heat will aid in disrupting the cell membranes and releasing the DNA into the solution and that requires heat so for that I will use a mini PCR machine as a heat block this will take my, uh, the rest of my family samples are already in there. And I'll just add my own, shut the lid, and mini PCR is very easy to program as a heat block and let that go for 10 minutes and 95 Celsius. And while that happens, um, I will go on to explain the next step, which we can begin setting up, which is PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. PCR is a very, powerful technique that allows us to find a DNA fragment of interest among a very complex mixture uh, containing DNA and other molecules. In today's case, finding the PER3 gene among all of my DNA uh, and perhaps also the DNA of microorganisms that inhabit my mouth. So not only will PCR find that PER3 target DNA, but importantly, it can also copy that target very specifically many times over. In fact, millions or billions of times in the span of one hour. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack, only that once you find the needle, you get to make copies of it. And so, so, so many copies that you fill up the barn, making the hay now invisible and all you see are needles. Uh, the way that happens is through an exponential copy process, and I won't get into a lot of detail about how PCR works, since we've already covered that in many of our previous webinars. And we also have a beautiful tutorial about what is PCR and how it works on the mini PCR website. So if you haven't seen it yet, 
I need a refresher for PCR, check it out at minipcr.com uh, forward slash polymerase dash chain dash reaction. That's at the bottom of the slide too. Uh, but just as a reminder, PCR copies uh, DNA exponentially. So in the first cycle of PCR, we'll go from any single copy of the target pair three gene to making two. As we repeat that on the second cycle, we'll make four, we'll repeat that, and we'll make eight, and from those eight, make 16, and you get the idea. After 30 cycles, we'll make two to the 30th copies of our target sequence. Um, that's about a billion, and that's what we call a chain reaction of exponential uh, amplification. The PCR setup, and again, I want to explain the components in detail because we've already covered that, but just to illustrate how easy it is to set up this lab, all the reagents come um, pretty much ready to go and mostly pre-mixed for your students. Um, there's a set of primers, the sleep lab primers, of which we'll add 20 microliters. So I'll set my micro pipette to that volume. 20 microliters. I don't know if you can see that, um, but I'll add this first component to my mix. And primers, as a reminder, are the small synthetic DNA molecules that will find the target DNA of interest. In today's case, the beginning and end, they will mark the beginning and end of the PER3 gene. Uh, I've got the primers. I've already extracted my DNA, so I will add that template DNA. That's my complete genomic DNA, the DNA of anything that was in my mouth this afternoon. Uh, for that, I need to set the volume in my pipette down to three microliters. My extraction is done, so I'll get a fresh tip. Take my DNA out of the machine and pipette just three microliters. I like to pipette into the liquid and then up and down a few times to make sure that things mix well. And now get a fresh tip and I'll add the final component which is the DNA polymerase. Our polymerase comes as a master mix that is already pre-mixed with the DNTPs, the nucleotides, um, the buffer, and it looks green because it even has a loading die that will make it easier to run uh, the PCR product on a gel. It'll make gel loading a breeze. Um, so I really like this master mix. That's our final pipetting into a tiny tube. I hope you can see that. Uh, final volume, 28 microliters. I pipe it up and down to mix, and that will go back into my mini PCR uh, machine. So, um, I put everything into the mini PCR machine, which is sitting right here beside me, and we're ready to run the program. So that will get going. And one of the really beautiful things about the mini PCR is that not only does it enable the copy process, but it also makes the process very engaging by showing you what's happening at each step in the PCR cycles and how DNA gets copied exponentially over time. And this can be seen through all, any of the platforms that support the mini PCR app. And that's pretty much any device you already have from a Windows PC, which is what I'm using today to a Mac a Chromebook, even your phone, tablet, or iPad will run the mini PCR app. Um, the software is indeed beautiful. It contains graphic animations showing what's going on at each step of PCR. Uh, right now I'm showing the first step in any PCR cycle, that's denaturation, uh, where temperature will rise to a pretty warm point close to the boiling point of water, 94C. And what that does is it disrupts the hydrogen bonds that hold the two strands of DNA together, allowing DNA to 
get single strand. The second step in a PCR cycle is annealing, where temperature comes back down, as we can see in the software that allows for binding of the primers. So as temperature comes down, hydrogen bonds can form again, and by base complementarity, the primers are going to find the beginning and end of the target sequence of interest, the PER3 gene. Notice that the temperature for different PCR programs, the annealing temperature for this specific step, uh, is usually the most specific part of a PCR program because different temperatures will favor binding of different primers to different DNA sequences. So you must set this temperature carefully to find your, your wanted target. The third step of PCR is extension, where we raise the temperature once more to the optimal catalytic uh, temperature uh, for the DNA polymerase to perform its job, which is to latch on to the end of the primers and add by base complementarity bases as it travels down the template strand. So where it finds an A, it adds a T, where it finds a C, it adds a G, and that way it makes a full complement of the original template strand such that from one copy, we went to two. If you repeated the three steps, you would go from two to four and four to eight in that exponential progression we just talked about, which is also illustrated nicely in the software to the right of that animation and updated as you go, as you go down uh, the PCR steps. So we talked a lot about technology, about technology, so let's go back to the biology now and remind ourselves why we're doing uh, this PCR. So we want to assess my family's genotypes at the PER3 locus, whether they have the four repeat, which will result, result in a shorter PCR product, or the longer five repeat variant that will yield a larger PCR product. But our ultimate goal is to test whether there's a link between these genotypes and different sleep preferences. As a reminder, sleep regulation doesn't seem to depend on a single gene but it's under the influence of many different genes and environmental factors. So we say that sleep is a complex trait. To study complex traits, one tool that one can use are genetic association studies. These are essentially big correlation studies that start with a premise that there's a lot of genetic variation in human populations for which we don't yet understand a role. And to try and make sense of that genetic variation, we can take a genetic sequence that is variable across different individuals and ask whether one of its variants is more frequently correlated with a specific phenotype. That is whether a specific allele and the phenotype go together more frequently than would be expected by chance alone. Now, to be clear, I use the word correlation because finding an association doesn't always mean that this DNA has a causal role in the phenotype. It simply identifies a likelihood that someone carrying that DNA will also display the given phenotype. So that's why um, association studies are often used to identify risk factors for complex diseases that don't have a single cause, like psychiatric illness, heart disease, pregnancy complications, and even sleep disorders. Uh, genetic association study in practice goes more or less like this in simplified form. You take a form of genetic variation that has no known function, for example, the two variants of the PER3 gene that we're studying today. Next, you want to identify a cohort of subjects that display the phenotype of interest, for example, being night owls. And of course, you'll want a control group that don't have the condition or disease. Next, you'll genotype them. And from today, we know that we can use PCR for that. Uh, perhaps we use other tools too, DNA sequencing, SNP chips, or other methods that help us read DNA at this specific uh, locus or point of variation. Um, so after genotyping, we typically have really large cohorts of patients, and we can't just eyeball the result, as you would want to do from my slide. Uh, and for that, we use powerful statistics to figure out if indeed uh, one of the variants occurs more frequently with uh, one of the genotypes. So for these analyses to be uh, clear, we want, of course, to look at large data sets, look across 
a large number of patients. And we also want uh, the phenotype to be very clear and well beyond the norm. Um, it, you know, like an extreme sleep phenotype. So in the case of sleep, there are many sleep disorders or conditions that one could look at, but one that we'll focus on today is called DSPS. It's an extreme case of being a night owl, and it stands for delayed sleep phase syndrome. Patients with DSPS have difficulty falling asleep at night at a normal time, or usually up into the very early hours of the morning, like 2 or 3 a.m. They also have plenty of difficulty waking up the, the next day for obvious reasons, and you guessed it, it's a lot more common in adolescents uh, than it is in adults. In fact, it is quite rare in adulthood. So a group of researchers several years ago looked at the question of whether DSPS patients had an association with one or the other per three allele. And the results go like this. Interestingly, a cohort of 16 DSPS patients, these are the extreme night owls, uh, when you look at these 16, 12 of them have the four allele in homozygosity, the short variant of PER3 in homozygosity. Then uh, four patients with DSPS had the four or five, a mix of the two alleles in heterozygosity, and none of them had the five five. When they looked at the next group, the night owls who were not as extreme as DSPS patients, but still had a clear marked uh, nighttime preference for activity, 20 out of 35, still a significant fraction of them, had the 4-4 allele in homozygosity. 13 were 4-5 heterozygotes, and only two had the 5-5 allele of PER3 in homozygosity. They also looked at intermediates, and the balance seems to uh, start to shift towards a little bit towards more 5 alleles. And they finally looked at a group of morning larks, people with early morning preference. And there you can see the 5-5 five, five allele uh, rising markedly. So if you look at this graph for the four allele from uh, right to left, there seems to be a drop in the relative frequency of the four allele as you go from evening folks to morning types. And the opposite seems to be true for the five allele. The five allele is definitely a lot more frequent in morning larks for this group in the study than it is as you move towards the right of the graph. So this is an intriguing case of potential association between the four allele and eveningness and the five allele and morningness. But do pay attention to the fact that by no means is this genotype deterministic of your phenotype. You may very well be a night owl and still be a 5-5. So the fact that you carry a 5-5 uh, phenotype genotype doesn't um, entirely determine that you become a morning lark. And similarly, for the 4 allele, you uh, may carry the 4 allele in homozygosity and be a morning lark. All that an association tells us is that is a um, likelihood, an increased likelihood, that given a specific genotype, uh, the carrier of that genotype will display the associated phenotype. It's like an increased risk. So association studies can help uncover relationships between genotype and phenotype, but the thing is that a single association study, especially one done on a small cohort, is hardly definitive proof of an association. And there are many complicating factors. Um, of course, we're dealing with complex uh, clinical phenotypes that may be hard to measure to begin with. Uh, these studies require large data sets from human patients that may be hard to recruit, sometimes limiting sample size. And uh, another important thing is that um, they may have a huge variability depending on genetic background. Because these conditions are multigenic, we're studying a single gene, but that gene is under the influence of other genes in our genome. And if you look at a population that has marked genetic differences, like do the study with Scandinavians and then try to repeat it with Japanese patients, the results may not hold up or look entirely 
different. So it's important to try and replicate these, these studies to see if these associations really hold true and are robust across populations. And as scientists that we are, that's what we want to do through the sleep lab. We want to see if we can replicate this association between PERT3 and uh, sleep preference. So let's look at our own data. And you already know that my cohort is pretty small today, so apologies for that. And we're all genetically related, so we share a lot of genetic background in common, uh, as we are the Craves family. We told you that we think we know our sleep preferences, but if we wanted to volunteer for an authentic sleep study, it wouldn't suffice to just show up and say, I'm a morning lark, I'm a night owl. We would want to obtain a more robust measure of that sleep phenotype and one that could be compared across individuals. And for that, sleep researchers have a tool. It's called a chronotype assessment. And it's just a more rigorous way of assessing your true underlying uh, sleep preference dictated by your circadian clock and not influenced by your environment. Um, a chronotyping tool that is available with the mini PCR sleep lab is the Horn and Esberg questionnaire. And as the name implies, we did not invent it. It was designed by two sleep researchers, uh, but we've just put it in a spreadsheet format that makes it really easy to do in your classroom or at home, wherever you may be. Um, and I encourage you to scan the QR code right here and it will take you, oops, it'll take you to a copy of the questionnaire. Actually, Google Drive will ask you if you want to make a copy, say yes. Uh, and it will take you to a place that looks like this, a spreadsheet uh, where you can answer 20 questions about your sleep uh, preferences. You can do it now if it's not going to distract you too much from following along. Uh, it's just 20 questions. You can also answer them later and it's multiple choice answers. So approximately what time would you wake up if you didn't have any obligations? Uh, you know, what time would you go to bed if you had nothing going on the next day? Do you need an alarm clock in the morning? Maybe a little, a lot. And as you answer these questions at the end, um, it will issue a numerical score. There's also um, a sharing feature built into our spreadsheet where you can email results to yourself, your friends, your teacher, uh, to make it easier to share the data and aggregate it. So let's go back to my slides. Um, the results are numerical and they reveal whether you have one of the more extreme sleep phenotypes or a more moderate version of a morning or an evening preference or you fall somewhere in the middle where lower scores mean that you are more of an evening type uh, and um, higher scores mean that you're more of a morning lark. And of course, there are no good or bad results. If you're in one of the extreme groups, uh, you may be a good subject for a sleep association study. But if you're more of an intermediate, you, you'll definitely be living in the comfort of having much more reasonable uh, sleep and wake up times than larks or owls do. But for all types, uh, one thing that knowing your chronotype can do is it can help inform when is your optimal sleep preference or what time of day you are in peak shape. So it's something uh, nice to know about yourself. So this is what the sleep lab questionnaire revealed for the Craves household. Uh, and for mom and dad, it confirmed what we already knew about ourselves. Mom got a score of 61, which places her in the morning category. And this is very much true based on what I know about her. Uh, me, on the other hand, I got a really low score, uh, putting me in the moderate evening category, which again did not uh, surprise me. The results for the kids uh, were a bit surprising. Uh, both Layla and Eva got intermediate results. They fell in the intermediate part of the range, although Eva did skew more towards the morning and Layla did score closer to dad, uh, which matches what I know about them and their sleep reference. So now that we have our phenotypes and we know in which 
uh, sleep preference group we are, we're ready to finish genotyping ourselves so we can test that possible association with the PER3 alleles. And so to do that, we're going to read my family's PCR results using gel electrophoresis. For that, I'll use uh, blue gel, which is this beautiful, elegant uh, gel electrophoresis system that's super compact, easy to use in a classroom as much as it is to use at home. It has a built-in transilluminator with safe blue light, so it allows you to see the results as the bands are separating, and it's economical, not just um, economical in price, but also in reagents because it uses very little, uh, very little stuff. So this will allow us to see the results of our PCR. Um, and uh, a reminder that gel electrophoresis is a method for separating DNA by size. And in doing that, we're aided by two things, an electric field that will pull DNA molecules and an agarose matrix that will act as the sieve or separator uh, of the DNA molecules. So I won't give a detailed class on gel electrophoresis because we've already done that in many of our previous webinars but as a reminder the agarose matrix looks like a mesh with pores of varying sizes we seed the dna at the top of the electrophoresis unit close to the negative pole the electric field pulls the negatively charged dna towards the positive pole and as it travels through the agarose larger DNA molecules encounter more friction with the agarose mesh and smaller DNA molecules run farther ahead creating separation by size pattern. If you want to learn more about it there's a nice tutorial on the mini PCR website at minipcr.com forward slash gel dash electrophoresis. So I made my gel at home using my microwave uh, and these beautiful gel green tabs that make it really easy to cast a gel. Uh, all you do is just pop one of these tabs into a flask and add water because they already have all the necessary components such as electrophoresis buffer and DNA stain to cast a proper gel. So once dissolved in that water, which just takes a few seconds, you microwave for less than a minute and then you cast uh, into the casting tray of the blue gel and here's what my gel looks like. I've just removed the comb. Uh, if you've done electrophoresis before, this will seem familiar. If you've never done it, um, just to get a visual quickly, this is what the gel looks like and it has the little pockets to seed the DNA samples. And as you see, it's a flexible, it's a flexible mesh. It's perfectly safe to use at home. I'm not wearing gloves in proper lab practices you would, but because it's safe, uh, I'm just using my naked hands today. Um, so I loaded my family's PCR products ahead of this webinar. So I took PCR products, uh, I loaded them on lanes uh, of my gel, and I simply press the run button on my blue gel, which is how easy it is to operate. Um, and I loaded the product in this order. On lane one, I had a hundred base pair ladder. Um, on lane two, I had mom's PCR product. Uh, on lane three, I loaded my own PCR product, then Layla's and Eva's. And on lane six, another instance, because I had empty lanes, of 100 base pair ladder, which is a molecular weight marker that's going to provide a pattern of fragments of known sizes of DNA that we can use as a reference to compare against our expected PCR products. Our expected PCR products for the large variant of the PER3 gene is a 284 base pair product, rather small. And because the repetitive element that's missing in the shorter uh, variant is 54 base pairs. Of course, the shorter PCR product, you did the math already, is 230 base pairs. So 284 for the 5 allele, 230 for the 4 allele. And I should have said this, but uh, blue gel is very easy to uh, run and also to capture images or video using the folder view, imaging hood 
you just it has a hole here like a peeping hole for your cell phone camera you just place your cell phone on top and that allows you to take either a still image or even a time lapse of your gel run which makes it very engaging and beautiful to watch so these are the results for the craves genotypes the moment we've all been waiting for so this is sped up about a hundred times relative to real time and there you see the two alleles start to separate and there they go all the way down let's run it again because it's just so pretty to watch <laughs> um, that's about 10 minutes in by about 15 20 minutes you start to see discernibly two bands about there and by 30 35 minutes you get full complete separation so let's move on to a still view to discuss these results in more detail uh, first i'll talk about what's not biologically relevant just to get it out of the way uh, at the bottom of the gel, we see some leftover primers that weren't used in the PCR reaction and just appear as this really hazy, faint halo at the bottom of the gel. They're very small. Primers sometimes bind to themselves. They can have some affinity for each other and form these little dimers that can be amplified by the polymerase and form these very short amplification products we call primer dimers. They're usually easy to rule out as a PCR product because they are below the 100 base pair uh, mark, as primers are usually 20 or 25 nucleotides long. And now on to the money. The results for mom show that she is a heterozygote. She has between 200 and 300 base pairs, two bands, one at around 230 and one closer to 300 uh, for the four and the five allele respectively. Dad, myself, I'm a homozygote. I only carry two copies of the four allele. Layla seems to have inherited one copy of each allele. And Eva got the four in homozygosity. To put it all together in uh, pedigree format, here we have Mom, the morning lark. She does carry the five allele that the association study uh, implicated as increasing the likelihood that you're a morning person. Uh, which interestingly I don't have and she did pass on that allele to Layla who also got a four allele from me uh, and myself I'm a 4-4 as the association study uh, predicted there was an increased likelihood that four fours are uh, evening types and Eva seems to have gotten my four and mom's four for them we can't really draw uh, too many conclusions nor should we really draw too strong uh, a conclusion from this very small data set but it surely was a ton of fun to figure out our phenotypes and link them to our genotypes and for completeness uh, just to illustrate what you could do in the classroom of course we have a really small data set here that we can't really try to draw an association from but it's nice to plot the data just like the association study did by categorizing uh, the phenotypes uh, one by one and mapping the genotypes onto each of them. So for night owls, we only have a single individual in our cohort. Uh, that's me with a chronotype score of 36. I'm a 4-4 four, four, uh, for genotype. In the intermediate bucket, we've got a 4-4 four, four, Eva and a 4-5 Layla. And finally, for the morning lark category, we do have one representative. That's mom with a score of 61, and she is a 4-5. With more data, you could start to draw uh, more interesting conclusions, and you could even take that into the territory of statistics, which is a really nice feature of this lab as well. One of the additional resources that we offer as an AP extension, or an, uh, an exercise that anyone can do, is to um, amass large cohort data from doing this experiment with your students where you get a lot more data than I got today and you might be able to perform a statistical analysis in the form of a chi-squared test that will tell you whether genotype and phenotype are simply assorted randomly or whether they deviate from a random distribution. That's another really nice feature for AP teachers. So I hope you had as much fun as I did 
and all of my family really did doing this lab and learning about the circadian control of sleep and circadian clocks. I encourage you to give this lab a try with your students whenever that becomes possible. It is very amenable to a classroom schedule too. In normal times, one can go through the whole lab in less than two hours, or if it needs to be broken down into two class periods, uh, the first class can be dedicated to extracting DNA and starting the PCR. Then the PCR can be left to run. And the second class period, which can be the next day or several days later, it doesn't really matter, can be used to run the gel. And do the phenotyping questionnaire and do the statistical analysis and all the other good stuff and talk about circadian clocks. So, you know, to sum it all up, Students love this lab because it allows them to study a behavior that is very near and dear to them, uh, sleep. It's also uh, a very exciting lab because it engages on a science question with an unknown outcome, as authentic science should be, as opposed to doing a cookie cutter experiment for which you already know the result. With this lab, every cohort that you run and get to do statistical analysis with, uh, and decide if the association holds up or not, is a, is a true authentic new experiment. Uh, in doing all of this, you'll learn how to study complex traits and you'll, let, you'll leave your students better equipped to interpret headlines that appear in the news as new association studies come out. In the last 20 years, we've seen a profusion of association studies with the advent of genome data. Uh, and you know we often read that gene X confers a Y percent greater risk of uh, developing disease Z. I think by doing one of these studies yourself, you get a much more palpable sense for how to interpret those results. And finally, this lab opens a window into that, the complexity of the genome and how to make sense of the wealth of genetic variation that exists. And who knows, maybe one day you can be part of the science teams that will help find roles for some of these unknown genetic variants. I also want to remind us that the story doesn't end with PERT3. The circadian clock is a complex feedback loop and several other genes are involved. Um, we only understand the tiny portion of how these genes and other genes outside the circadian clock uh, influence sleep. Uh, the clock includes not only PER that we talked about today, but cryptochrome, which we mentioned briefly, clock, BMAL, reverb alpha, many, many uh, components of the genetic feedback loop. Uh, and in fact, just three years ago, the lab of Mike Young, one of the winners of the Nobel Prize that I mentioned earlier, came out with a study showing that a polymorphism of variation in cryptochrome, cryptochrome 1, CRY1, uh, is also associated with DSPS, the night owl phenotype, in this case by a very interesting mechanism uh, extending the duration of that feedback loop, making it longer than 24 hours and causing the people carrying this mutation or this variant uh, run on a very slow clock and find it really hard to fall asleep at night. Look up the study, the reference is there. And finally, our genes don't have to have the last word. We shape our sleeping habits through our choices, our food intake, whether we like the nightlife or not. So. I invite you to take the chronotype questionnaire, reveal your sleep preference, and develop habits that will work best for you and your own internal clock. Do check out the mini PCR sleep lab resources page, download the questionnaire, of course, browse the classroom materials. They're also posted in the YouTube description uh, below this video. Uh, and check out all of our other resources. 2020 has been uh, quite an unusual year, of course, and we know it's really hard for all of you to get hands-on with biology. We really appreciate what teachers do, uh, and we try to keep creating ways to make that possible even during a pandemic. From our P51 labs, they're very easy to do at home, to genes in space, our science competition where students design experiments, they don't need to do them, an astronaut will do them for them if they win on the International Space Station. It's completely free to participate. And then all of our webinars um, on this channel, which uh, have been so much fun to put together. And if you're unable to do PCR and gel electrophoresis at home, like we did today, uh, you could check out our line of at-home labs. 
that delve into uh, essential biotechnology techniques that are not maybe as uh, difficult to implement as PCR and electrophoresis, but micropipetting, uh, self-free gene expression, and our P51 labs. Another great resource are DNA Dots, Dots series at dnadots.minipcr.com. Uh, our two-page explanations of current topics in genetics and biology, and they come with nice questions for classroom assessment. Uh, we even have one on association studies, a specific type called GWAS, genome-wide association studies. That goes really well with this lab. Um, external resources that I'm grateful for and that you might find useful in your classroom. Um, HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, has supported a lot of circadian researchers over the years. Um, they also supported me during my PhD. Thank you, HHMI. Uh, but they put out beautiful interactive resources explaining um, the circadian feedback loop and the role of genetics. Um, Joe Takahashi, uh, famous circadian researcher, is featured uh, in, in their videos. They're really great. Uh, the Nobel Prize also put out very clear explanations in 2017 when they gave the prize to Ross Bash, Hall, and, and Young. Um, and check out what they wrote about circadian clocks. And for genetic association studies, I found the resources from the National Human Genomics Research Institute um, very, very clear and explanatory. So please do check them out. There are about three minutes left, and thank you for submitting a bunch of questions ahead of today. I wanted to give time to some of them. Sorry if I can give voice to all of you, but you can always email us at team at minipcr.com. Um, one of the questions was what environmental influences interfere with circadian cycles? And we talked about light. Also food is an important um, Zeitgeber is the German word that circadian researchers use, uh, which means like an entraining signal. Uh, light in particular is probably the most well understood. Uh, the master clock in mammals resides right above the optic nerve and it receives innervation from the retina. And it's super interesting because light can entrain circadian clocks even in blind people. This is a super interesting piece of biology where there's a dedicated photoreceptor in a retina called melanopsin that uh, is not an image forming uh, photoreceptor, is not involved in vision at all. It's only dedicated to transmitting light signals to the clock in the blue light spectrum. So that's why some of our devices like computers and phone screens try to avoid blue light and have the night mode where things look a little warmer. That's because blue light is a very powerful influence on the clock. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, what are the optimal nighttime sleeping hours for human beings was a question and somebody else asked, why do I sleep better in the daytime? I think we've touched upon the answer to these questions by chronotyping yourself, hopefully through the tool that we offer. And <laughs> you should probably talk to a sleep uh, doctor if you're really curious about this. We're not sleep doctors. Uh, but the chronotype can be a, a fun tool to better understand what's the optimal time for you. There's no one size fits all. Each of us have different uh, circadian clocks, slightly different circadian clocks. Uh, there was a, another question about whether sleep apnea is a genetic her heritable trait um, and, and similar questions about other sleep conditions like sleep paralysis or night terror genetics. So uh, today we've touched upon everything that you need to understand the complexity of sleep disorders. They're not single gene diseases, they're multifactorial. Uh, a quick search yielded a paragraph that could have been very applicable to the lab we did today. The causes are complex, there are multiple genes involved, the contribution of the individual genes is not fully understood, but we're, geneticists are working on it. So that's all we had to cover and we're just on time. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the lab and thank you so, so much for joining us today. Hope to see you soon at one of our next webinars.